Welcome to the Highland Archive and Registration Centre. My name is Lorna Steelmogan. I am the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. Now normally for this day, each year we would be throwing open our doors for Doors Open Day, welcoming people in, putting out displays of our amazing archive material that we look after and taking you on tours of the building, telling you about what we do. But of course we haven't been able to do that this year. So instead we put together a short film to tell you a little bit about the amazing documents that we look after in this part of the building, documents that date from the 1200s right through to the present day. We're also going to tell you a little bit about some of the favourite documents chosen by members of staff and show you into our strong rooms and into our family history centre. This building was built in 2009. It houses the registration service for the Highland Council. So we have registrars here who register births, marriages and deaths for the area. We house the council's semi-current records department, the records management department, and of course, the Highland Archive Service. Now, the Highland Archive Service has four centres across the Highlands. This is the hub centre here in Inverness. We also have the Sky and Lochalsh Archive Centre in Portree, Loch Aber Archive Centre in Fort William, and Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick. And together, the four of those make up the Highland Archive Service. So come into the building with me, find out a little bit more about what we do and the records that we look after. And I hope you enjoy it. This is the large ceremony suite. You can hear it's a, a large and spacious room, usually seats 100 people for wedding ceremonies, but obviously through COVID times has uh, seen far fewer numbers. This is uh, where marriages are held. We also have a smaller ceremony suite as well. And of course, the registrars in this building not only work here, but go out to do marriage ceremonies across the Highlands. The Highland uh, Registrar, the Chief Registrar for Highland is based here, and she also oversees the registrars right across the Highlands. So a really big remit being run from this part of the building. If you want to find out more about Leslie, the Chief Registrar, and find out what the work of the registrars involves, then please do have a look at the film on our YouTube channel, which is uh, an interview with Leslie talking about the work of the registration service. Having left the entrance foyer and the ceremony suites behind, we come up the stairs and the first room we come to is the Family History Centre. So we're going to head through there and see what resources are there for researching your family history. My name is Graham. I'm one of the archive assistants here at the Highland Archive Centre and I'm here to tell you about the Family History Room. In the Family History Room we have many resources which will hopefully help you with your family history. We have the censuses for the Highlands uh, between 1841 and 1901 on microfilm and before 1855 it wasn't compulsory to register a birth, marriage or death in Scotland so we have to look at the old parish registers which we also have for the Highlands on microfilm. We have many other resources, such as books relating to uh, varied topics like clans, um, immigration, Jacobites, Culloden, lots of different things. And we also have the Scotland's People um, terminals, which are administered by our registrars, which are of um, great help regarding family history. Graham has told us a little bit about what the resources that we hold to enable you to start your own family history the census records, the old parish records, and so on. And if you want to come in and use those resources, please just get in touch with us. Our email address is genealogy at highlifehighland.com. But what about if you have started your family tree and want to understand how to do a bit more? Or what if uh, you would want to do the family tree, but you want someone just to give you some pointers? Well, the next person we're going to speak to is my colleague, Anne Fraser. Anne is our family historian. She undertakes commissioned research for people, both online and in person. And she is uh, the master at unlocking those uh, problems you might come across, the brick walls that you might hit. So we're going to go in and have a quick word with Anne, find out what she does before going on to have a look in our search room and speak to some of my colleagues in there. After I've handed over from Anne, it might be interesting if you are interested in pursuing your family history a bit more, please do contact us. As I say, that's our email address. We also run online classes for how to start your family history, which Anne delivers. So we'll go in, have a word with Anne, and then head on through the rest of the building. Well, I help people trace their family history by in various ways. They'll come um, and sit one-to-one, -one, sit here in my office, and we can discuss what to look up, and I can produce a family tree for them, like you know, see some behind me up on the wall. 
um, I can do this work remotely, so no need to come in, or we can actually have a discussion over Zoom. Um, and we can find lots of information in an hour for you as well. Lots of people want to do their family history for lots of different reasons, um, just to find out where they've come from, what's the ancestral home for them. And uh, But sadly, some people want to find because of health issues, uh, maybe genetic diseases in the family. So it sounds quite sad, but maybe they want to know all that information. And um, I also will carry out some family history classes for people that would like to do it themselves. And I do encourage that, that it's good to do the journey yourself. This is our archive search room. This can seat 24 people in normal times, slightly fewer, of course, during COVID. I'm standing next to uh, our catalogues. So none of our archive material is held out on the shelves. It's all held securely in our strong rooms, which we'll go through to shortly. So the way to access the catalogues, there's two things you can do. From home, you can access our catalogues online now, which we're delighted about. So you can have a look on our website or just search, type into a search engine Highland Archive Service online catalogues, and you'll find information there about not completely all, but many, many of the collections that we hold. If you come in in person, either after making an appointment or just coming in on the day, then you can have a look through our catalogues here. The black ones are local authority catalogues. So these are split into the Highland Council, Highland Regional Council, uh, the District Councils, County Councils, boroughs, and so on. These will give you information about anything that was administered by the local authority, and we'll talk more about that when we go into the strong room. On my other side here, you can see our deposited records. So that split is very clearly mirrored within our strong rooms, which we'll touch on in a second. So here we have in green the fire brigade and the northern constabulary records. These three red ones are the Highland Health Board. So these include records of the district asylum and other hospitals. These two are church catalogues. So around about a thousand volumes of Kirk Session records, Presbytery records, and so on. So these are the established church, the Church of Scotland, and the Secession Church, the Free Church, which then went on to rejoin the Church of Scotland. Across the bottom here, these blue ones are deposited collections that have been given to us by individuals, businesses, societies, and so on. And what you would need to do to come in to find out that these, these particular ones you can access through the deposited uh, topical index of deposited collections. The other thing to do, of course, always is get in touch with us. Ask us what we've got, tell us what you're interested in, and we will have a look through our collections for you. But you can see from the, the subjects I've mentioned already what a diverse range of collections we hold. I'm going to go over now and speak to two of my colleagues, Pionag and Alistair, to hear about some of their, their favourite records and why they've picked them to talk to you about. So I've come over to talk to my colleague Alistair, who's one of the archive assistants here at HARC, and he's going to tell us about some of his favourite items that he's chosen from the collections to talk about. So I think, you've, first of all, you've picked a, a scrapbook photo album. Yep, this is from the Macpherson collection. Um, it's one of 46 scrapbooks dating from the late 19th century through to almost the present day. And yeah, pick the first one in the collection, the oldest one, this is really fascinating. It's a huge, a huge collection covering, like you say, a huge time period and lots of different generations of the same family, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary that anyone, that one family would take the time to have such a diverse collection. Yeah, from the great, great grandparents right through to the their great great grandchildren. Yeah, to the yeah. present generation. <laughs> yeah. And this one has got a mixture of all sorts of different things in it. I think that's why you picked it. Yes, yeah, so there's you know, nice illustrations, there's poems, there's news clippings. I think this talks about street lamps coming to Newton Moor. Because of um, course the family are based predominantly in, in Newton Moor. Yes, exactly. And you know interestingly there's an old school jutter here from eighteen fifties. And do we know who, whose that was, or we assume it's a, mem a member of the family? Um, it says Archibald McPherson on the front. I think okay, he's yeah. one, of, one of the family, yeah. And it's beautifully written. And I think I remember you saying it's got a Gaelic poem in the back of it. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so it's good to see Gaelic. Yeah, we don't have a huge amount of Gaelic in the collection, something we often get asked, but not a huge amount Yeah. For yeah. this poem. <laughs> and I think you said one of the reasons you'd pick this was because it's a collection that you've catalogued, so you feel 
personal connection to it. Yeah, well, both of us have catalogued it together. They've invested a lot of time of hours, days, weeks. Alistair and I share the Macpherson collection. <laughs> I started cataloguing it and then he has finished cataloguing it. So, yeah, we both have a connection to it. And a family with a really interesting history as well. So, um, I think in this album we're looking at the, the oldest generation of the family who had a connection to India. Yeah, so Sir Tommy Macpherson's father was a judge in India. And there's a lot of photographs from their time there, mm -hmm. the early part of the 20th century. Yes, yeah, so pictures of uh, the family house, the family, um, people that they, that they knew and associated with, and this one, I think, one of your favourite ones. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a tour of the district in North India with the family all on the back of an elephant. Yeah, and let's see, so he was uh, Tom, Sir Tommy McPherson's father, a judge in India. Sir Tommy McPherson, a really um, notable and highly decorated soldier in the Second World War, I think. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I loved when I was um, started cataloguing this before I handed it over to you to uh, to finish was um, all the connections to there's cards from Roger Bannister, there's letters from um, Winston Churchill, and all sorts of people. In Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly, yeah, exactly, mm. all sorts of connections. So a really diverse example of one of our family papers. What's the one at the end that you've picked? So this one you said was late 19th century. What's the one at the end? A different date, a different subject. Okay, so this is a petition by Alexander Mackenzie of Newton of Berntosh from 1814. And he's been caught with um, some illicit whiskey in his house. Right, okay. And it's interesting because it's not... It's, it's a, uh, to do with something illegal, but it's not from our court papers, it's from a family collection, isn't it? Yeah, it's from the Bailey of Denain collection. Um, it doesn't seem to fit in with anything else in the collection, so it's just quite lucky it survived. Somehow the family have held on to it within their, their records. And that one, so the first one you picked was from down uh, Bainock and Straths Bay, so the south of the area we cover. Mm -hmm. This one, I think, is, you said, Ferntosh, so Ross and Cromarty. Yeah, so it's on the Black Isle, and it's actually an upland rural part of the, the Black Isle, so he, he probably was a poor crofter where he was living at the time. And you can tell from this petition how poor he was. If I just read out. Yeah, please do, because I remember you said one of the things you love about it is how it's written, so please yeah. do read it out. <laughs> So your petitioner has poverty, 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 bad health, which is legible in his countenance and throng, and weak family, without a horse or a cow, a calf or a sow, a cart or a plough for supporting them, and is situated in a barren, vain, rough, ragged, rugged moor, without one inch of arable ground, where he built his house last year. Yeah, that's it's really poetically written. Yeah. And what I'll do if um, if you didn't catch all the words of that was like, oh, we can put the transcript up in the text of this so you can read that as well. <laughs> so yeah, it goes on and then talks about how he'd recently lost three children in the space of a month to smallpox, wow. as well as his wife. So he's in a desperate place and now he's um, been accused of housing illicit whiskey, which could lead to criminal proceedings. So it's a real snapshot at a low point of somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's a very emotive, desperate plea. You know, please don't hammer me too much. Well, that's interesting, because I know one of the documents that we're going to look at shortly with uh, our colleague Fiona is, is again, it's a, a somebody giving a plea for help for, for other people to, to not treat, you know, to, to help them and support them. It's interesting that you've both gone for those. But that just echoes what we always say, that our documents are full of stories of people going through experiences and, um, you know, at low points and high points in real people's lives. Mm -hmm. And what's the third one you've picked? Totally different again. Yeah, the final one's from down Drumnadrochil Way by Loch Ness. It's a Balmacan estate sale catalogue from 1945. Okay, so we have a big collection, um, D4, deposited collections of sale catalogues from right across the Highlands, and this is one of those. Yeah, yeah. And the thing I really like about it is the the way it's been pieced together um, with postcards by an Andrew Patterson of Inverness. So there's lots of landscape photographs from, from the area from the 1940s, which is really interesting to look at. And along with the photographs is uh, a history of the, the area. And it goes into details of the whole estate, um, the people who live in the estate, the houses on the estate, the crofts. 
So again, it's a real snapshot in time of the people living in a place at any given moment. Yeah. But a far cry from most sale catalogues. I mean, I've never bought a huge estate, so maybe I'm wrong, but um, of the, the sort of sales we see today, this has historical background, contemporary information about mm -hmm. people, about places, pictures and postcards and so on. Yep, and it goes into real detail on each craft, how many rooms are in the house, what rooms there are, what buildings are outside. Um, this one has a calf house, a loose box, a bar for six, three stall stable, a bar and a granary, that, that sort of thing, as well as listing the person who's occupying the house at the time and how long they've got it leased for. So it's a, a, probably a really good family history resource that people wouldn't think of. Mm -hmm. Why would you think to look in a sale catalogue for family yeah. history information, but it's there? Yeah, so family history and local history, social history. Yeah, absolutely, and 1945, so a, a key point. I don't know, we would need to investigate whether the house was, was requisitioned or used during the Second World War, but an yeah. interesting point that it turned. Mm -hmm. And just you know, to tie it off, it's, it's got a a map of the estate as well, showing the boundaries and the places on it. So it's kind of got everything you need in a whole package. Yeah, all the information about the area and you can, uh, yeah, visual representation of what you're buying. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, that we spoke about when we looked at it is the opening yeah. paragraph, which just seems really, really current because it, it opens saying that the world has been in turmoil and chaos, but now we're returning to normal and people are looking to move to the countryside, yep. <laughs> which is exactly what we're seeing at Very the moment. Very familiar. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for talking us through some of your favourite things. We'll put some pictures of them up on Facebook as well so that you can see, uh, read a little bit more about them as well. And I'm going to head over and speak to my colleague Fiona now to find out what she's picked. So I've come over to my colleague Fiona to look at some of her favourite documents, which are um, totally different from the ones that Alistair has chosen to talk about. So you can see the breadth of the collections and the different things that we look after. So I think you're starting with a letter from the 1820s. Yes, this is a letter um, written in 1828 uh, by a man called John Ross. And I, I find it particularly interesting because we have, what, thousands of letters here yes, in the archives? <laughs> yes, a lot of letters. Um, and the majority of them are probably from kind of wealthier, more privileged points, points of view. We don't have so many from the everyman. So this is a letter from somebody who is quite desperate. He's pleading to Isabella Bailey, who he's hoping can influence the decision of the Board of Commissioners to let him work as a lighthouse keeper. He has trained for this and has just been told um, by actually Mr Stevenson himself that it's unlikely he'll get employment in the next few years. So this is quite a blow to him because um, 1828 in the Highlands, life is hard for most people. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> exactly, and, yeah. yeah. And in fact, he, he has got employment already at this point, but um, it's just not enough to sustain his family. His, he's already been removed from Lewis and he now just lives in Skye. So um, he writes this letter to Edin, Edin Bain, um, which is near Portree, and... Uh, it's just a pr pretty desperate. So it's a very sad letter, but I think a very important one because it does get, give that perspective of the, of the everyman. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And you particularly have an affiliation with, I was going to say sad stories, but you know what I mean. Well, maybe I do. <laughs> Heart-wrenching, heart emotional yeah. stories, but also with the coast and the sea and lighthouses. And well, that's, and I'm from Lewis myself, so I'm from an island, so I, I can understand maybe the, the, that kind of point of view as well. Um, and the importance in Lewis and the importance of lighthouses and what they, the exactly. difference they can make to life. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, so with so many things here, you come across things sometimes by accident. Um, I was actually looking out things to do specifically about lighthouses for a, 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 in fact, pre probably, possibly a previous door open day. Civil engineering. <laughs> yes, it probably was. And um, I, this, this was such a relatable um, letter. Not that I've I'm in the same situation, but you, you see around you today still, and... Yes, and um, people being qualified for something that they're... Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and particularly just now, exactly, yeah. yes. People having to retrain, um, because at the moment he's a, a teacher in a side school. Okay. Um, but it's but just it's not, not enough. It's, for, it's, it's not, oh, or certainly it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to, to keep his family with, with food. But that current, that current resonance is something I was talking to Alistair about as well, and it's very... Um, it, it, reinforces the thing we always say about the fact that they continue to be relevant, the documents exactly. continue to be relevant in their own right, yeah. but also as a reflection of something we're living through again. Exactly, yeah. 
and you were speaking there about how many letters we have in the collection. This is from Bailey of Domain Collection, which on its own has over 4,000 letters. Yeah, well, that could, yeah and that's just <laughs> so one of many collections. Of yeah. So you're moving from something personal here yeah. to something more institutional for your next one? I guess it does, yes. This is um, from our R91 collection, which is the Northern Constabulary um, records. So this is the copy order, and we've got the Chief Constable, first entry actually, um, giving a report on the misdemeanour by suffragettes. Um, again, I feel this is a very important and interesting document because, again, this is a subject that we don't have a lot of records of. The, the suffragette movement, of course, was in the Highlands, but we don't have um, much documentation at all. So this is quite a special record. Um, there are newspaper articles, but as far as actual official records go, hardly yes, any. It's passing references yeah. in, in mm. a letter about seeing a parade or seeing something happening, yeah. but not, not a huge amount of personal take. And again, like so many things that are controversial or um, banned or prohibited, we see it in the official record exactly. rather than in the personal. Yeah, and it would be so fantastic to get it from the other side. But If you're listening and you have <laughs> diaries of somebody who was a suffragette, please give them to us. Please do. <laughs> okay, yeah. so what's the... I could read it out a little bit, yeah. Yet. So I'll read most of it out. It's not that long. So this is dated um, the 20th of May, 1913, um, written from Dingwall. In view of the vast amount of damage done by suffragettes and other irresponsible creatures to property throughout the kingdom and the possibility of their extending their operations into this county by way of setting fire to houses, plantations and moors, I am desirous that the police throughout the county be vigilant in their beats in keeping close observa observation on all strange women and known local ones likely to be influenced by strangers. It goes on a wee bit like that. Um, so they were obviously very concerned that this was... Absolutely. Um, my, my passion, which I share with you, is language and the way words are used. And, yeah. and you really see that there, the, the, the belittling and the, oh, yeah. you know, you are uh, creatures. Yeah. That, that thing of turning people sort into Dehumanising them almost. Mm -hmm. Othering, again, very current thing to, to other current. people and put them into a different category. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So it's quite, yeah, a, quite it's a, a huge, a huge book and full of all sorts of information to do with... Uh, I think that one oh, covers the war period as well, so there's information yeah. there about, yeah. uh, and the First World War to do with the introduction of daylight savings and all mm -hmm. sorts of things in that book. And again, this is one of many volumes. Um, you can see the you extent see the of it there. So there's a lot of <laughs> very, very interesting things yeah, in absolutely. here, and va varied, as you can imagine, from police records, varied um, subject matters. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the third one you've picked, I think you've picked a couple of things from a collection to represent an entire collection, and it's one of our absolute favourites. Oh, it really is. It's such a diverse collection, possibly one of the most diverse collections that we have here. Um, this is the collection of Margaret or Meg McDougall. She was curator of the Inverness Museum here and also county librarian, um, county and borough li librarian. And oh, you've got a nice photo of her. Yeah. The picture, and again, we'll put that up on our Facebook page so you can see it a bit more clearly, but that's a picture uh, of Meg. And so Meg, um, she was so passionate about collecting folklore. Um, um, she was an, an expert on many, many things. She was the go-to person for things like tartan. So we've got, she's got quite a few samples um, of tartan that she collected. Um, so we've got a lot, a lot of boxes with, with things like that in it. She also was invaluable to um, people today trying to do research because what she did was she typed out a lot of the original manuscripts, like um, unpublished minutes from the town council um, and loads of things, again, that she just um, came, came across that for a lot of people might be quite hard or laborious to work through, hard to read or laborious to actually research. So she, she's typed them all out, um, which makes it fantastically accessible. So, so for us, we accessible. have a typed version of some yeah. of her manuscript early documents, which is great. Yeah. And she is a gateway to all sorts of subjects because sometimes she's gone right through those and theme, put them into theme and research. Yes, that, exactly. So we, we can put in a, a keyword on, onto our own database and actually we, we, we come up with, with something quite um, esoteric often. I mean, she's got a, a notebook on witchcraft. Yeah. She's got, a note, she's got notes on things specific, things like the Clach and the Stone, the Keswick Ferry, and then she's got a broader um, kind of view of just general Customs old... Oh, yeah, exactly, superstitions, yeah. clans, and, and fa how families are connected to one another in, in the area, or to the area. Um, oh, I mean, there's, there's just so much that quite, she's we covered. We use the phrase, we'll go and ask Meg. Yeah. Maybe Meg's already looked at this and then welcomed yeah. us away in. And for those of us who write newspaper articles, I write for the Northern Times, my colleague Jennifer writes for the Inverness Courier uh, and the Russia Journal. And for, for those things, it gives you a way into... She's got the history of all the schools in Inverness. 
things like that, or and churches, uh, churches, and, yeah. street names, building, mm-hmm. and it gives you a way into to maybe broadening research on the subject. Old Inverness Silver. She was yeah. actually, I think, on, on various committees as well. So, and a yeah. prolific writer for her own research and also in newspapers and, and things. Well. Yeah. So we have copies of articles that she's written. And yeah. One of my favourite ones is on local characters. Um, oh, yeah. which is just the most fantastic names of people. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, she's <laughs> which, an astonishing collection. Which yeah. I, well, I'll just leave it there and you can come in and look at it. <laughs> but no, it is. It's a wonderful collection yeah. that we use for all sorts of things. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's all right. That's sharing some of your good fun. Things. I know it's nice <laughs> to talk about them, isn't it? No, it really is. I, I know. Yeah. It Thank is. you. It's all right. through into the conservation studio to speak to one of our conservators, uh, Carrie Farnell, who is one of the people who looks after the documents that you've been seeing my other colleagues talking about. So Carrie, can you tell us a little bit about what conservation is? Because I know sometimes people don't really understand what what that job is. Um, So uh, what we do in conservation is we repair old documents and we make them usable for um, the public and um, if we have, a, say, like a book that's become um, unbound and needs repairing, then we will repair it so people can reuse it and look up research. And, and one of the things people always ask is that you're not filling in, you're not replacing anything that's missing necessarily, you're just stabilising it for use? Uh, yes, it, we are just... Um, stabilising, we don't add any history to the document or... People always ask that, don't they? Do you fill in missing words or <laughs> you never do that? Yeah, we get all those kind of questions of like, oh, you add this word on and we're like, no, 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 we just uh, we just repair it so people can use it and 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 uh, enjoy the documents and... Uh... And we're really fortunate to have a conservation studio, aren't we? There's not many uh, in Scotland, so we do work for... High Life Island, but also work for external organisations. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Like we're the one of the the furthest north conservation studios, and, and that's something yeah. you, you do a lot with your time, isn't it? Is work for people out with the, yeah. our own company. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm currently working on uh, parchment uh, documents for Argyll Estates at the moment, and mm. repairing a few seals. As and that's well. been a big. Uh, project hasn't it? Lots of things within that collection that you've been working on. Mm-hmm. There's about 17 of uh, different parchment uh, documents, uh, and they're they're all uh, different, requiring different repairs, and they're all interesting and uh, very old. <laughs> do, do you know what date the one is you've got there? I think this one's 1568. I think. Okay. So yeah. it's quite uh, intimidating at first. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure you look after <laughs> yes. every faith in you. Um, so it's the kind of things you're describing there. You need what sort of skills? Uh, dexterous hands, I'm guessing. You need to be able to do fiddly work. Yeah, um, you have to be quite good at art and uh, you have to be, you definitely have to be uh, dexterous. Like um, you, You've got to be kind of patient as well with yeah, things. Yeah, long processes. Yeah, because sometimes things don't work and you have to try something else. So you just have to be prepared for it and, and very patient and And a lot gentle. of understanding what things are made of, so understanding the types of ink that would have been used at a certain time or mm-hmm. things like that, what surface it's written on. Mm-hmm. And the materials as well, like, uh, for example, this is parchment, which is sheepskin, uh, which is what they would have um, been writing on for hundreds and hundreds of years before paper was invented. And parchment's quite um, temperamental to uh, humidity and water and temperature as well. And um, if it's too much heat, it can cause damage. And but still one of the most stable... Mm-hmm. Things, isn't it, it is, yeah, it is. Um, you'll find that paper will um, definitely disintegrate before parchment will. And the inks you're usually looking at, I'm not a conservator as you know, so iron gall inks? Yeah, iron gall ink um, has been around for hundreds of years as well. Um, it's um, it's also very temperamental to moisture as okay. well. And, and very different from the ink we use today? Oh yeah, it is. Um, a lot of the inks we use today are, war- they, they are fugitive in water, which just means that they can like smudge. Or okay, 
which is Me. why you run through to the post box in the rain trying not to get your address <laughs> covered in water. <laughs> yes, whereas you wouldn't have that problem with iron gall ink, it wouldn't run, it sort of bonds to the paper. And, okay. Yeah. And one of the things you do before you do any work on them is test all those things. Yeah, we do. We run uh, loads of tests just to make sure the inks are stable, especially if we're doing treatments in water and uh, and so you've got like a red ink then it's quite um that can be quite fugitive in water so you have to sort of test it and so there's differences within the colors yeah definitely there's different pigments and things whereas iron gall ink um you can wash with it but it might cause damage later on to the the actual paper i see because it's more of a um, acid than a than water so it's like and one of the things I've heard you and Richard, our other conservator, talking about a lot is, is acidic things and taking the pH levels mm-hmm. down. And... Yeah, we um, we have to um, neutralise the acids a lot because paper gets more acidic as time goes on. So it's um, you can use something called calcium bicarbonate to uh, lower the pH to neutral. And I think mm. it's important as well where, you, where documents are stored. So before they come to us, obviously, you get them when they've been mouldy or wet or uh, have creatures living in them and all sorts of things. But also when they leave here, they need to go to somewhere, you know, many people at home keep them in wooden cabinets and things like that. And that's not the ideal no, place to keep them. No, it's not. Um, you want to keep them somewhere nice and dry, um, um, away from any light sources, light sources or heat sources. You, Maybe um, not near anywhere that near water pipes or anything yeah. like that. Um, I know it sounds it sounds really logical, but we all do it at home because yeah. you put them where you've got the space to put them without yeah. necessarily thinking of. It. And lots of people make the same um, sort of the mistakes, same mistakes yeah. and uh, we get people people coming in all the time that have been like, oh, I've uh, had a leak and uh, yeah. yes and mould is growing on my documents and it's just like oh no <laughs> <laughs> yes that must be a horrible image to you when it first comes in to see it like that yeah, yeah. but it's a challenge i suppose yeah because it, it, it is preventable so it's just like i think more the more people that know to yeah how to look after things the better and I, as we always say the other one is sellotape oh sellotape a disaster <laughs> <laughs> Again, people do it because they think they're doing the right thing to look yeah. after a document, put sellotape on it, and it causes damage. It does. Um, I don't use sellotape at all. <laughs> Just, yeah, don't use it. Use a water reversible tape. That's yeah. my advice. Well, as we said, as you said already, the same things crop up again and again that people do. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And how did you become a conservator? If people are watching and they're interested in it as a career, how did you get into it? Um, I volunteered um, with my uh, first job. I uh, was an archive assistant and I volunteered in the conservation unit for about three years and I just thought I really like this so um, I um, was looking out for courses and stuff and um, I ended up doing, well I ended up getting the job here which was a trainee conservator job where they funded me to go and uh, do um, the archive um, conservation certificate so um, that involved going around different archives around the country doing like placements so um, that sort of I was doing that for about five years until I got qualified but I was also working here so I was getting the experience yeah, yeah. both practical and the theoretical mm-hmm. at the same time yeah so um, when I completed my certificate um, conservative job come available here so I applied for it and um, here now. Here <laughs> here <I> am, yeah. <laughs> awesome yeah. thank you so much for telling us a little bit about that and uh, if you want to find out more about our conservation services then have a wee look on our website there's more information there as well thanks welcome to strong room one strong room one is where we keep our local authority archives Altogether, across the Highland Archive and Registration Centre, we have six strong rooms. We have three of this size, and as you can see, it stretches behind me quite a distance. And we have three that are slightly smaller. One of the larger ones is dedicated for uh, records management staff. So these are semi-current records administered on behalf of the Highland Council and still used by the Council.
One of the smaller ones is dedicated to the registration service, so the registrars who record birth marriages and, birth marriages and deaths for the Highlands, and they have one of the strong rooms. The remaining four, two of this size and two slightly smaller, are dedicated to archive material. Strong room one, as I mentioned, has our local authority records. So these are the records of the Highland Council and the predecessors of the Highland Council, the boroughs uh, and the county councils. And then coming forward uh, through time after local government reorganisation to the district council, to the Highland Regional Council and so on, into the days of the Highland Council. These are some of our most widely consulted resources. So, for instance, the valuation roles that I'm standing next to at the moment record the occupier, tenant and proprietor of inhabited properties from the 1850s, 1850s through to the 1980s. So these are some of our most uh, frequently consulted resources. Also in this room are education records. So the records of schools across the Highlands. We have about 700 school logbooks, school admission registers, and things that can be really useful in tracing the history of a particular school, um, but also for continuing family history research and finding out where your ancestors attended school and what life was like for them. This strong room also contains um, poor relief records. So these are records that detail assistance given by the council, predecessors of the council, to people in need across the area. A very interesting and useful set of records sometimes very uh, heart-wrenching, sometimes you're seeing people in very, very difficult cir circumstances, but information in there, again, which is very useful to family historians, and also really interesting to see the development of healthcare and welfare in the Highlands. The front part of the room where I'm standing here holds uh, the county records. So I'm standing right next to County of Inverness. It then goes on to uh, County of Ross and Cromarty, County of Sutherland, County of Nairn, and then uh, parts of Murray. You'll maybe see here that the exception to that is the fact that I'm standing next to some County of Ross and Cromarty valuation rolls. This is the only exception to that system. So where I'm standing now, there's County of Inverness valuation rolls, County of Ross and Cromarty, County of Sutherland, and so on. And the reason for that was the valuation rolls are so popular that they are the only ones to be taken out of the system and kept together here. So they're still numbered in the numerical system, but for convenience, they're held here because they're so frequently used. So that's the front part of the room. Into the second set of these, we have our borough records. So for instance, Inverness Borough, we have an almost consistent run of borough minutes, town council minutes from the 1550s through to 1975 when local government was reorganised. And then, as I mentioned, we have the Highland Regional Council minutes, the Highland Council minutes and so on. So we have Borough of Inverness, Borough of Dornoch, Dingwall, uh, Nairn, all sorts of other boroughs across the Highland. You may have noticed in the areas that I've mentioned that I'm not talking about the whole of the Highlands. And the reason for that is the Highland Archive and Registration Centre is the hub office for the Highland Archive Service. So we hold overarching Highland records here, and we hold records that relate to the County of Inverness, Ross and Cromarty, Sutherland, Nairnshire, and that uh, part of Murray. Our other offices in, uh, in the Isle of Skye, in Portree, uh, in Loch Aber, in Fort William, and in Wick, in Caithness, cover the records for those discrete areas. So across our four offices, we make up the Highland Archive Service and we cover the whole Highland area. But that's what's held in this building. I'm going to take you upstairs now to Strong Room 2 and tell you a little bit about some of our deposited records. Welcome to Strong Room 2. Come upstairs from our local authority archives up to our privately deposited collections. Now, as I mentioned, these are things that have been given to us by clubs, societies, uh, families, individual people, businesses to look after them for the long term. Many of them are given to us on long term deposit, which means that the person who owns them retains their ownership, but they're stored here and used here and accessed by members of the public. And many are given to us as a gift. The main thing is that these, as with the collections downstairs, will be preserved and safe to, to use going forward, to tell the story of the Highlands and the wide story, the, the story of rich and poor, the stories of businesses, of schools, of daily life, of life for the aristocracy and life for the ordinary person. So it's really important to us that we have a real cross section 
of records. And if you're aware of records that are at risk of being lost or you think that would benefit from being here to inform and help people learn about our collective memory, then please do contact us about that. So I mentioned some of the examples of record collections that we hold up here. So for instance, we hold the records of the Northern Constabulary, the records of NHS Highland, historic records only. Um, individuals and societies, as I mentioned. An example is this one here that I'm, st that I'm standing next to. These are the records of the Caledonian Canal. So these records record the construction, uh, the, the design, the building, the operation, and uh, the infrastructure of the Caledonian Canal. This is a great example of a collection that we have all sorts of uses for. So people come in with a general interest, finding out about the canal and how that changed the, the landscape of the highlands over the past nearly 200 years. We also use them with current engineers working on the canal who have come in to look at plans to work out things rather than draining sections. I've also used them in my job as a community engagement officer with people from the Canal College. So these are people uh, who attend the Canal College, learn all sorts of really useful life skills. And one of the things they do as part of their course is to come in and find a little bit about the history of the canal and the place that they're working on. So these records that were written 200 years ago uh, as a record of the construction still have a really active life. And the same can be said for everything that surrounds me. One of the things you'll notice, these are volumes, and I spoke about the valuation rolls and volumes downstairs. You'll see in strong room two, we have many more boxes. So these boxes uh, are really useful. They are archive, uh, archive boxes, so they're uh, acid free and so on. But the reason we have so many boxes up here as opposed to just volumes is that these often contain bundles and bundles and bundles of letters. So for instance, in our family and estate collections, we hold the Munro of Navarre papers, we hold uh, the Fraser Titler, the Bailey of Denain. In our other offices, we hold uh, Cabin of Loch Eel, all sorts of estate and family records. And these often come in the form of hundreds of letters bundled together. And that is what's hidden away in these amazing, uh, kind of plain and simple looking boxes contain all sorts of exciting treasures. I really hope that you have enjoyed finding out a little bit about the Highland Archive Service. If you want to find out more about who we are, what we hold, what we do, please contact us. We are available on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can email us. You can uh, contact our family historian to find out more about how to trace your family tree. Uh, our website will give you details for that. It's genealogy at highlifehighland.com is the, is the email address. If you're interested in finding out more about the stories, that these boxes and these volumes hold, then please join me for Learn with Lorna every Thursday at 11 o'clock, where I look at, on Facebook and then on YouTube, I look at some of the stories from within these collections and tell you about why we keep them, why they're so precious and all the different things that we and you can do with them. So I hope you have uh, join, enjoyed this short film and short look into some of the things that we do. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>